The lesson today, let me give you the genesis of it, but I also want to give you a disclaimer. And the disclaimer is very important. Not being a lawyer, I don't always know the right words to say. And so if I say something wrong about anything about the situation, that's all on me. That's not on anybody else. I don't want to ever get one of the inmates in trouble or mess up an appeal or anything like that. So with that said... A long time ago, uh, a few years, which is a long time ago, one of our members came to visit us from Louisiana, and they talked about a prison ministry they were involved in, and and I said, how can I help? And immediately he said, well, some need spiritual advisors. You're only allowed to have one per prisoner, and that means that this individual was not able to advise all the people that they would like to help or who needed help. And so I signed up immediately and got started, and that's how I met Bobby, a man who's on death row in Louisiana State Penitentiary, and Angola um, is the name of the plantation on which the penitentiary was built, uh, and therefore people usually refer to it as Angola. He's been on death row for decades now. A new administration has come in, and as administrations do, they change rules, and in fact, they run on that we're going to put more people in prison, we're going to keep them there longer, Uh, we're going to take away some of the avenues for release that they used to have, whether it's parole, pardon, commutation, or whatever, they moderate that, and they're going to make it much more strict. A lot of uh, appeals fail, and so you keep wondering about how do you maintain hope in these situations? And I must tell you that this has been a challenge for me because although every time you see me, I'm talking and I'm engaging with folk, when you don't see me, I'm not doing either. I'm an introvert. And the very thought of going in into a room one-on-one with somebody for two, three, four, I did not know it was going to be longer. Uh, Now Bobby sets the hours. He just sent me an email a couple days ago, said, we're set from 10 to 2.30, so four and a half hours, sometimes in an eight by six concrete block room. And it's just us. And it's very intense because it's personal. Now for him, it's easy. Bobby's a very personal person. He loves to talk. He loves to engage. Um, it, to me, it wears me out by the time, you know, they almost have to carry me out on the other side of the wire. But um, it's a blessing. And Bobby's been a blessing to my life. And so as I've seen the rules change, and the hopes, however, however thin they might be, get even thinner. They're not gone, but thinner. I had to just ask Bobby. Uh, I saw the morale crashing uh, among some of the workers and some of the prisoners. And so they brought us into a room that was a temporary room. Therefore, it was even smaller. It was seven by four. And we're sitting there, barely enough room for us, a little table and our two chairs. I said, Bobby, with all of this going on, what does death mean to you? Here's a man on death row, has been for quite some time. And his response to that was a lesson that we worked on for four hours in that small locked room. And that's what we're going to talk about here. So let me put it to you this way. Anything good and insightful came from Bobby because I've never been on death row. I have considered, I've contemplated death. I've been around death a lot and even contemplated my own from more than one time. But it's not the same. It is not the same as daily grind for decades and decades. So anything good in here comes from Bobby. How's that? He started with Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 15 through 20. See, I set before you life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God and to walk in obedience to him and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient... And if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will be certainly destroyed. You will not live long in the land you're crossing the Jordan to possess. This day, 
I call the heavens and earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your children may live. And may you love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life. And he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The first thing he talked to me about was, we know what God demands from us, but we have turned aside from that. We no longer value life. Now, we do not do politics here, and we will not do politics. We'll never tell you who to vote for. We'll never tell you who not to vote for. But that does not mean that we do not speak to issues that are issues of God. And the issue of God is life. And any nation that has no regard for unborn children is a nation that is under a curse. And any nation that makes the killing of unborn children a major thing they want to do is a problem. We have great sympathy and support. And by the way, people will always attack Christians and they will say, but you only care about children in the womb. When was the last time you saw an atheist children's organization, an atheist uh, group that supplies diapers and food and shelter and money and such for for mothers that that need the help? You don't. It's Christians that do. Don't let people lie about that. As Bobby said, and I quote, are, we pardon turkeys, but not human beings. That hit pretty hard. Life is important. Life is important. That's why we take care of our elderly when they can no longer contribute to society. And sometimes when they can no longer thank us or recognize who we are, we take care of them because God set beside us, before us, life or death. And he said, be careful which one you choose. By the way, that doesn't mean that this party's good and that party's the other. We're also not, not fans of war. Life is precious. We value human life. And yet our, our nation, our cultures, our neighborhoods, our political parties, and this is not just in America, this is everywhere, we tend to go tribal. And we view other people as our enemies and actively work to take away their hope. No, they are not okay. They are these bad words. They are, we're going to shunt them off to the side. And by doing so, we end up destroying the very society that protected us and that we say we want to protect. Bobby said by protecting society from people who have turned their life to God And made it obvious that they are Christian. In fact, you can't find somebody in a prison who has something bad to say about Bobby. He's never said that to me. But I've heard other prisoners. And in fact, two nights ago, I believe, I got an email. Maybe it was last night. Things get blurry. From uh, one of our members who is in contact with other prisoners. And a prisoner had written him saying, Bobby is genuine. In all the years I've seen him, I've never heard him say a bad word about anybody mistreat anybody or show anybody anything but grace after all of these years on death row, not once. And he says, by trying to protect society and running on these, these platforms and such, we turn society into warring factions that embrace the death of their declared enemies. There's sometimes blatantly they do this. It's... Um, when politicians or marchers demand more people in prisons and more deaths. But often it comes in the form of compassion by saying, well, we won't put those people in prison. We'll put these people in prison. We're going to be compassionate to these and then these commit more horrific crimes. As Solomon warned in Proverbs chapters 5, 6, and 7, death often comes wearing perfume. Be careful that in the name of compassion... We are not embracing death. So it is not as simple as we can't put people in prison for this long. We, We all know that some people who should be in prison aren't in prison. Justice is not going to be found on earth. 
The scripture says that often. Isaiah even says, truth has fallen in the street and there is no one there to help it. Bobby and other Christians on death row, whenever I respond to them, and yet you're still here, they respond with Matthew 10, 28. Do not be afraid of those who can only kill your body. And I see no fear in him at all. As he said, Hebrews 9, 27. And by the way, they know their Bibles better than I do. They know their Bibles better than you do. <laughs> Whoever you are. You might have a PhD. You might have a, a doctor of ministry, which I've, I just find hilarious that we contract that to a D-men degree and you're in ministry. D-men seems wrong. Anyway, they know their Bibles better. They study them. They study. We have over 70 men at any given time that receive our notes and share them. They share them not only with other prisoners, but with their families who go home. And some of their family members are pastors. And those pastors take these notes. These are being taught all over because these men are faithful and share. And because we have a couple of members of our safe harbor who take their time and effort to make sure, because you can't mass email and it costs money every time you email an individual. And therefore, they they make sure every person gets them. But as they said to me, we die once and face judgment. Hebrews 9, 27, everybody does. They say, we do not fear death because 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20, God's promises are yes in Christ. The promises of God do not fail in prison or out of prison. Death by execution or death outside the wire. We often think of death as a coming darkness, a looming obliteration of all we see, think, feel, and know. And I talked to Bobby quite a bit about that. And I said, Bobby, I'm not afraid of death. I am afraid of dying, but there is something about death that bothers me. And he said, what is that? And I said, I'm I'm really going to miss me. I've known me all my life. And I know I'm going to live beyond, but it's not going to be the same. And I'm also aware of the passing nature of people's affections and knowledge. In 50 years after I die, I doubt that anybody's going to be thinking of me or quoting me or knowing me. In 100 years, I'm going to be completely forgotten here. And he looks at me and smiles like, well, of course you are. What's the problem? And I'm saying, that's the problem. I'm going to miss me. I'm going to miss me. And so he smiles and he says, he said, God lays out darkness before us like a jeweler brings out a black cloth and lays it down so that when he puts a jewel on it, it shines more brightly. Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 3. Arise, shine, For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth. Thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. And as Bobby said, people all over the nations are already coming to our safe harbor, but really they're coming to Christ because of this. And Bobby's already preaching to nations all over the world. He said that he heard from God years ago that one day he would preach to the nations. And he said, if I'm released, I will, but I'm already doing it because our safe harbor has provided that opportunity. Quote from Bobby, we win because Jesus has already won. Death is not the worst thing that can happen to us. Losing our faith and our hope in Jesus is. And then Bobby quoted Hebrews chapter 11 to me. Did I mention they know their Bibles better than we do? It's almost encyclopedic knowledge. And by the way, as Adam said in his giving devotional, when we have the funds to do so, we help other people. And one of the people we've helped is Bobby by increasing his library because he will, he will ask about a subject and what he, 
He doesn't want books like most of us go out and buy. He wants um, reference books, concordances, commentaries, deep study things, interlinear Bibles, where one line is English and the other is Greek or Hebrew. Uh, and he, he talks about that other prisoners come in and look at his cell and say, what are you doing with all these books? And it gives him an opportunity to talk. Faith is confidence in what we hope for, assurance of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand the universe was formed at God's command so that what was seen, what is seen, was not made out of what was visible. And he went on quoting Hebrews 11. It's one of my favorite passages because it lets me off the hook when people look at me and say, Patrick, just believe. Well, God never said just believe. He said faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things not seen. To Bobby and the other believers, I asked, what is your evidence and what is your substance? And as Bobby smiled and he said, Oh, we can still move mountains, but we might have to do it with a spoon. In other words, we might have to be patient. As he's told me time and time again, don't deny the process. God's answering prayers, but don't look for instant. Don't deny the process. I asked him if he felt isolated from God. He said, no. He said, we praise God from ourselves because Psalm 23 and verse 3 in the King James Version phrases that he inhabits your praise. Their response to isolation, darkness, and hope being taken away from them is to praise louder. I have heard Bobby sing and he would put all of us to shame and blow out the windows of this nice, sweet soundstage we had. I'm pretending we have windows. We're underground. But um, we're literally an underground church in America. You, you, can, you, can, you can spin that however you wish. But he, every Sunday he sings, but it's also every day he sings. There have been people that want to get closer to his cell, you know, be assigned closer because of that, and there have been people who wanted to get away. But Bobby sings. He says, because when I sing, he inhabits the praise. And he's reminded me several times of 2 Chronicles chapter 20, where King Jehoshaphat, before the battle, sent the choir out ahead of the warriors. Now, you've got to admit that that's a strange battle plan. When was the last time that the military saw that we need to assault this ridge? Let's send the band out first. But as the choir praised God, the scripture says, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah and they were defeated because God was in the praise. In the praise, God was setting the ambushes. We all know Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. If we praise God, as he says, Bobby, God gets in the middle and God adds his blessings. When it looks like the enemy is won and all hope is lost, God is up to something quiet. I had not heard that phrase before. He says, God is up to something quiet. You just got to trust him and praise. And so they sing. They quote the Psalms to each other. They, um, I will admit, for those of you that are doubting, that have some questions, you're allowed to. That's fine. Nobody ever said that we're supposed to be stupid. There are jailhouse conversions that are not legitimate, that are, that are fake, just like there are jailhouse mental illnesses that are not, and physical illnesses that are not. We all know that. But you can't keep up a charade for 20, 30, and 40 years of the intense zero privacy, zero moments alone that you have in death row or on life row. By the way, I call the other camps life row because they're in there for life, many of them with no possibility of parole. But Bobby calls death row life row 
because that's where he met God and in a real way. He'd known God before. He had attended church before. He knew about God, but that's where God met him and got him. So he calls it life row. But anyway, I know, and I'm not stupid, I know some prisoners will take you for a ride. This one isn't. And our guys down there aren't. They're solid. And I'm grateful to the Our Safe Harbor team because it makes it more difficult on them. I'm absent a lot to go do welcome home things. But about every six weeks, I head down to the prison. And that takes a while. And in October, the plan is for me to go down for the rodeo because during the rodeo, the rules are relaxed to the point where I can visit more than one person. I can walk around and visit a bunch of our guys. And our members who have been working with the prison for a long time are the ones who will guide me and say, that one is ours. That's Solomon. That's Milton. That's, that's Floyd, but we call him Boo. That's, and I can go visit with the people that I email Every Monday morning, I sit and do a lot of emails, and it's worth, it's worth it. By the way, most of the time the emails come back, they come back just to encourage me, not asking for anything. Just want to lift you up. This is real. Psalm 102, 17 through 21. This came from Bobby, asked me to read this as well. He will respond to the prayer of the destitute. He will not despise their plea. Let this be written for a future generation that a people not yet created may praise the Lord. The Lord looked down from his sanctuary on high. From heaven he viewed the earth to hear the groans of the prisoners and release those condemned to death. So that the name of the Lord will be declared in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. And when the peoples of the kingdoms assemble to worship the Lord, it's when we worship the Lord moves. We worship and praise. Like the apostles in prison, they sing at midnight. They organize prayer groups. Bobby, upon hearing about the new administration's rules about chopping off a lot of the ways that people could release, be released, about their rules about restarting the death penalty, um, I ask him, what do, you, what do you do? What do you do? And he said, well, the first thing is, I asked the warden if I could start a prayer group. And we would meet once a week to pray that God's will be done, that uh, anything that's not of him is turned away. And he got pushback, not from the warden, but from other pastors who wanted to be in control of all the things. And I said, Brother, I understand. Anytime you want to do the will of God, there's going to be somebody to go, our church does it different and I'd like to be in charge. But he keeps pushing. We're going to pray. We're going to respond with prayer. He said that God gave him Psalm 117 as his instruction. Psalm 117 is the shortest chapter in the Bible. I'm glad God didn't give him 119 because we don't have time to read that one. But Psalm 117 Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. And that's what he does. Quote, Anyone can praise God on the mountaintop, but will you praise him in the lowest, darkest place? Will you trust him there? One of the things about meeting Bobby and working with Bobby and, and some of these other men. And by the way, I'm very upfront with them about my own struggles with faith, about my own struggles with, faith, with prayer, about how, you know, I've got questions and such, and they just smile. They don't, they never shame me. They never say, well, look at us, and we have more faith than you. They never do that. But by their very faith, they do sometimes put me to shame. And there's, it would be wrong for me to hide that from them. Or from you. Bobby said, When I hear the promises of earthly government about us and against us, I hear one word from God praise. The book of Habakkuk, uh, it looks like Habakkuk, but Habakkuk in scripture. It's a very short book, but it's one of those that I really, really love. 
And he and I went to that in in Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. If you don't know the book, he starts with a complaint to God saying, God, this isn't working. We are worshiping, we are praying, we are doing what we're supposed to do. And yet this is happening and this is happening and this is happening. And by the way, if you don't know this, you are allowed to complain to God and lay out the list. You are allowed to wrestle with God. That's the whole point of the Old Testament and their prayers and such. You're allowed to do this. If you're wrestling with God, at least you're in touch with him. You haven't wandered away. So God responds and says, yeah, you're doing those. But you're also doing this, this, this evil, and this evil. And you're allowing that evil. And you're accepting this evil. And you, there, by the time he's done, Habakkuk goes, you're right. So he wraps it up by saying, even if food goes away, even if famine and water go away, and even if everything goes away, yet I will praise God. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. That's what the prisoners taught me. We all know this, and he and I talked about this. I can't remember which one of us brought this particular one up. But you often find God at the end of your rope. As a president of one of of a Christian university once told me, he said, we serve an 1159 God that always comes at the last second. And I said, yes, but the problem is we always think we're in the last second. We always think that now is the crisis. We deny the process, as Bobby would say. He told me, remember Mordecai and Haman from the book of Esther. The rope the enemy has set against you will be used against them. In Isaiah 54 verse 17, this is phrased, no weapon against you will stand. By the way, I want to make it very plain that neither Bobby nor I, nor any Christian that I know, takes any joy in saying the weapon fashioned against us will be used against them. We don't want weapons used against anybody. We don't want anybody to come to harm. We don't want our enemies to fail in their life, in their faith, in their families, in their jobs. We just want them to fail in their evil. That's all. The prisoners say, as they sing, as they pray, I got to talk to you about those prayers. As they sing and as they pray, they're not alone. And they never feel alone. In Psalm 79, another verse he gave me. None of these verses came from me. May the groans of the prisoners come before you. With your strong arm, preserve those condemned to die. Were you aware how many scriptures are about prisoners? And we know that in Matthew 25, one of the reasons why people are welcome into heaven is I was in prison and you visited me. And I got to tell you, Jesus is in prisons. I see him there. And their faith is amazing. About those prayers. They pray Psalm 70 daily in their prayers. It's only five verses, so I'm going to go ahead and read it. They do this every day. Hasten, O God, to save me. Come quickly, Lord, to help me. May those who want to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. May those who say to me, aha, aha, turn back because of their shame. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. And may those who long for your saving help always say, the Lord is great. But as for me, I am poor and needy. Come quickly to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. Lord, do not delay. You know, there wouldn't be much wrong with us adopting that practice of praying that prayer every day too. Just a thought. Writing it out, even, in our own hand. About the prayers one time, and he had to buy them. You have to buy anything that's not really poor processed food. But he came in one time and we sat to talk. He always brings in hard candy because he knows... We can't go out. We can't bring in anything other than what we buy. Uh, When I go in, and this is not just me. This is anybody going in. We have to take in cash to buy 
meal for my, ourselves and for the prisoner, but also have to buy meals for them later in the day. They have all sorts of reasons, but it's really a money-making thing. Everything is. But he always brings in hard candy just in case our throats get dry. But then he held out and he put down two of the little communion sets, the, the rip and sips, we call them, the styrofoam and the Jolly Rancher juice on the other end. <laughs> and I, I wasn't aware he could get those. And I said, Bobby, I didn't know you could get those. And he said, I wanted to do communion with us. Well, I prayed first. That's, that would be my recommendation. If you're in a room with these folk, pray first. Because after you hear them prayer, pray, you're going to realize you don't know how to pray. It comes out. Power, emotion, praise, worship, and it goes on. Now, I've always been part of the, the British Commando um, School of Prayer. Get in, do your job, get out, hope nobody notices. This is something very, very different. And I, I always reach over to take his hands. Bobby's a big guy. He was a boxer, and I'm pretty sure he still could be. And he grabs my hands, and as he prays, he tightens his hands. So I'm paying attention. I never nod off, because you know, I've got, I've got um, physical help. And he goes, and he goes, and every word is sincere and powerful. And I keep going, God, I hope it's all right that my prayers are so anemic but I didn't learn these prayers. I didn't grow in these churches and I've not been through the hell these men have been through. The prisoners, we talk, to, we talk, he, we talk about those who died that they couldn't go to the funeral. He lost his mom and couldn't go to the funeral. He always asked me about how I'm doing after my mother passed last November. He said, quote, don't worry, my mother and your mother are talking about their boys. God always gets, a thousand, gets the final word. His quote to me, you can have a thousand no's, but you just need God's yes. And as I've already told you months ago, he said, you can't threaten me with heaven. Please remember those in prison. Please remember that we are to stand for life and justice, yes. But our God never said, I am justice. He said, I am a just God. He said, I am love. God is love. May we learn to love the very people our society tells us to hate and fear. Now, we don't need to be stupid. We don't need to act like, well, people who run riot and burn things down and steal things, that that's absolutely fine and they're okay in society. But there must be a medium somewhere here between let everybody loose and let no one loose. There must be somehow a movement from punishment to rehabilitation. Some of these men have gone from GED to master's degrees. In prison. I asked them. Why? Why? Is it just something to do? Because you're being told. You will never be allowed to leave this place. And they always smile. And say well. God always gets the final word. And they want to prepare. And help others. And so they do. It's not just the faith of the prisoners. We need to listen to the faith of the sick, the faith of those in chronic pain, and ask them, how do you keep your faith? With doctors, I had, I had an amazing doctor in Scotland, a Dutchman, John de Vries. I think he had four earned doctorates. I looked at him thinking, all right, life goal there. I'll never make it. But he's amazing. And I... Walked in the first time. I was having a, a health issue, pretty serious at the time to me. Never met him. And we sat down and had a conversation for about 40 minutes. And then he just wrote out a couple things for me to take. And I, the next time I went in, I said, I do have to ask you, Dr. DeVries, 
why didn't we talk more about what I was sick? Because what he gave me fixed me and didn't have side effects. And I said, why don't we talk more about that? And he kind of cocked his head and he said, I am not interested in what disease the patient has. I'm interested in what disease has the patient or what patient has the disease. He says, I want to know who you are. He said, I'm not interested in combating illness. I'm interested in strengthening health. Sometimes when people say, I just can't stand this anymore, I remind them that they already are. Instead of saying, I can't, maybe we should figure out the way that we already are taking it. We already are tolerating it. We're, we haven't given up yet. What are those skills that you've already got? Let's find those. Let's enumerate those. Let's name them and let's strengthen those. And those words from the old therapy days have come back to me again and again. Let's find out those in chronic pain and instead of ignoring them, ask them about their faith and how they're holding on to it. Those who are sick, those who are caring for aged parents and are worn out. Those single mamas who are worn out. The prisoners. Let's talk to the people that Jesus would talk to and ask them, how do you keep your faith? And learn from them. Because I think some of us keep our faith because we're spoiled. We got more food than we can eat. We got more stuff than we need. We have more toys than we need. I even have more golf clubs than I need because some of them are being punished by not being played and kept out in the the garage. We have too much. And yet, we demand more. And sometimes we hold our faith hostage when perhaps we should step back and say, maybe we're all prisoners. Maybe we all have lessons to learn.